Oi, oi, all right, all right, how's it going? I'm Grant, you're you, this is Doodle Review, and this is the first episode in a new series I'm calling Ulterior Underground. In this series, we're gonna dive into the bands, artists, scenes, and cultural artifacts of alternative rock from years past. Today's episode, we're gonna look back at the online alternative music phenomenon that was Buddyhead. If you're not familiar with Buddyhead, on the face of it, it was a website, but imagine for a second a combination of Rolling Stone or NME in the 70s or 90s when those entities last cared about actually cool shit, uh, disruptive record labels like SST or Sub Pop, uh, the irreverent tone of a publication like Vice in its early days, the satire and humour of The Onion or The Hard Times, the DIY destruction and chaos of jackass and skate culture, and the gonzo middle of the action journalism of writers like Hunter S. Thompson. If you combine all of those things, that gives you some idea of what Buddy had, although just a website, but what it really represented for so many people between 1998 and 2008. They also had that rare thing, the thumbs up, thumbs down ability to set the tone of what was cool and what wasn't. Julius Caesar in the Colosseum style, kind of like the mythical hard to impress record store owners we'd hear of from generations past. It was initially started by photographer Travis Keller as an online portfolio of his work following bands around the LA punk scene, but it soon evolved into a record reviewing, trash talking, record releasing, rock star torturing machine with many different contributors over the years, be they writers, musicians or artists. Buddyhead was hugely influential to me growing up and I was fortunate enough to actually interview founder Travis Keller recently. Uh, and in advance of releasing that full length conversation, I wanted to do an episode to kind of set the scene for those not familiar with this underground entity and give you, I guess, some context before you hopefully come back this time next week to hear the full interview. So stick around as I count down the five ways I think Buddyhead changed alternative music culture in the 2000s. So the first thing we have to talk about, the thing that Buddyhead is most known for, is the absolute chaos that came out of its trash talk and gossip sections of the site. It's here that Keller, Icarus Line guitarist Aaron North and other contributors really earned their reputation for fuckery. Given Keller's primary creative outlet as a photographer shooting punk shows all over LA with bands like Ink and Dagger, At The Drive-In and close personal friends The Icarus Line, while also hopping on the tour, bus, uh, tour buses with the likes of Rancid, Primal Scream and even at 1.9 Inch Nails, the organisation had unfettered access to the rock scene and industry of the time. Coming up on punk, on hardcore, on skate culture and just 90s subversiveness in general, naturally the buddyhead instinct was to use this access to take down those they saw as the posers, hacks and sellouts that were enjoying success at the top of the industry and the gossip section was where this all went down. This was pretty much a daily column at one point and sadly a lot of it is hard to find but among these tirades you know you would get fairly innocuous claims or stories about roadies on the pixies tour needing to store frank black's mic in its own sealed case due to horrendous and well-known bad breath to relentlessly mocking the so-called antichrist super t marilyn manson's backstage stupidity kings of leon's alleged or sometimes it would be less salacious but equally interesting like the time jimmy Eat world got dropped from a weezer tour well it was because Interscope paid them 250k to replace that band for the latest crap that they would put on their roster. They'd mercilessly slate phony bands with just enough inside information for it to really hurt, but would also just full-blown go after a huge act like Guns N' Roses, leaking the track Chinese Democracy, but remixing it to include a rap verse that tore Axel down for his previous racism. You have to remember that at this time we're talking literally turn of the millennium so online culture and discourse was in its infancy forums were kind of a thing but social media didn't exist twitter didn't exist youtube didn't exist pitchfork and vice were just starting and while like people magazine and tabloid rags existed in print for years those were mainstream publications who had no interest in rock culture unless you were literally number one there was a whole upper echelon of successful rock artists selling millions of albums that for many years yeah, enjoyed carte blanche to just act like complete douchebags and big time those they saw as beneath them because there were no outlets that cared enough to expose and ridicule them for their pompous excesses and dirty secrets until buddyhead the true backstage stories became infamous within the entertainment industry those that got hit hated the site and its founders but those on the inside of the business that escaped it were hooked 
random as hell but like Ben Stiller, George Clooney and Gwyneth Paltrow were reported to be avid readers and eventually regular targets of ridicule would attempt to strike back with public threats, cease and desist and legal action but these acts of retaliation though would only fan the flames. Keller and co would make it their mission to piss off these rock star hacks and secret fans in the industry would help them passing them cell phone numbers of the likes of Courtney Love, Marilyn Manson and others to publish on the site, resulting in non-stop prank calls to their offices and prima donna tantrums galore. With Limp Bizkit, the antagonism escalated to the point of Keller and Powell's breaking into their label offices, stealing all of Fred Durst's trademark red snapbacks and auctioning them, and in a final twist of the knife, then donating the proceeds to rape charities, kind of lampshading the toxic culture surrounding Durst and Bizkit that led to the sexual assaults at Woodstock 99. The symbiotic relationship between Buddyhead and the chaotic rock and roll Hellraiser's The Icarus Line also meant that the publication was often at the centre of destruction too, vandalising the Strokes tour bus. Destroying a Stevie Ray Vaughan guitar at the Hard Rock Hotel were just a couple of stories that ended up on the site, with a first person account to go with it of course. Travis and I actually go deep on a couple of these stories in the upcoming interview, so subscribe to be notified when that drops, or if you're watching this in like a week. Uh, just hit the description to find it linked down below. Okay, so the next thing that I think set Buddy Head apart was not just the journalism, but the music itself. Uh, a few years into the site's life, the collective began pressing and distributing singles, albums, and merch. This would see Buddy Head effectively become a record label, putting out seven inches, tapes, LPs, and CDs from the likes of uh, bands like Dillinger Escape Plan, at the Drive-In, Murder City Devils, Ink and Dagger, Burning Brides, and of course, The Icarus Line. But one of the coolest releases, I think, was their compilation album, Gimme Skelter. They got famous Black Flag artist Raymond Pettibon to illustrate the cover, and the tracklist featured rarities and exclusive tracks from the likes of Mud Honey, Weezer, Primal Scream, and even completely original segues and recordings from Iggy Pop. Buddy Head still puts out records in its current form, just recently putting out some great work from underground bands, bands like The Cauterizers and Pyramids. You can check all of these out on the site, which are linked down below. So one of the core aspects of what attracted people to Buddy Head was how credible it was. That might seem weird to say for an often like satirical, humorous prankster site, but the fact is the deep ties the contributors had to legitimately great music in the scene gave real credence to the shit that they liked and especially the stuff they didn't. This legitimacy also fed the more controversial aspects of the site like gossip, head, uh, gossip and trash talk because the publication was so well liked by industry insiders they attracted hot tips from really authoritative sources. At the end of the day, there's only one reason someone like Axel Rose retaliates to a shit-talking indie blog, um, and it's probably because what they were saying is pretty near the knuckle. Speaking of old Axel, he's one of the primary examples of the next key component that made Buddy Head what it was, and that was humour. While Pitchfork and the legacy music media were out there trying to seriously analyse and critique the latest albums, Buddy Head scored things on the Axel Rose scale. That ranged from audio death, aka audio aids, <laughs> skull fuck, all the way up to killer. You didn't have a review unless it was ranked somewhere on this scale, as far as I was concerned. I get a feeling that like a lot of this video is like explaining a joke after the fact, but whether it was a positive or negative review, everyone would have a dryly sarcastic, often mean tone that would genuinely, genuinely make you laugh. Um, and there's no way the hard times weren't buddy head readers back before they started their thing. Last but not least, buddy head had taste. And not just that, more importantly, they took a stance. They had an opinion. If they liked something, it was celebrated. But if they didn't like something, you, you knew about it. Just pers perusing some of the archived reviews, this one stood out for pop singer-songwriter Jason Mraz. Remember him? We're now aware of what the sonic parallel to being sodomized in jail sounds like. Mixing the funky white guy sounds of the Dave Matthews band and the rhythmless hip-hop skills of Will Smith, Jason Mraz has created the perfect soundtrack for attempting the impossible task of sucking your own dick. Rich white college guys with sideways trucker caps and puka shell necklaces who are trapped in the closet are super psyched on this crap. <laughs> There's also this gem breaking down 20 things they'd rather do than listen to Beverly Hills by Weezer again. Would I always agree? 
Well, yeah, because I was an impressionable young teen who thought I needed to adopt the taste of those I thought were cool to be so myself. But eventually I grew out of that. There's there's plenty of stuff they hated that I consider myself a fan of now. But at the end of the day, it was just so cool to read a strong point of view that also came from people that knew good music and were involved in the making of or the distribution of that good music. To be honest, myself, as someone posting reviews online, I probably could take a leaf out of their book because I genuinely oh, generally like give everything the benefit of the doubt and maybe I do skew a little too positive but I don't know I can't kid myself if I tried to roast albums like these fuckers did I'd come off even more of a dork than I already am and let's be honest some of their shit talking wouldn't always fly in the age of the new internet puritanical wave that we are <clears throat> anyway there we go that's five ways i think buddy head changed music culture if you didn't know about this collective of like journalists artists and musicians and the movement around it hopefully this has been fun and you'll find some new stuff to check out travis keller is still very much doing his thing you can find him over on instagram patreon and the new buddy head site all of which is linked down below hit us back here again this time next week where we'll be chatting to the man himself talking about everything from feuding with Limp Biscuit to touring with Nine Inch Nails to hanging out with Oasis. Till then, take care, mate. Bye.